free man may live. A series of television programs concerning you and your freedom. Produced by KTCA-TV, St. Paul, Minneapolis, for the National Educational Television and Radio Center. The price of freedom is constant vigilance, a vigilance which must face many threats. Direct your attention now to one who works and fights for freedom, Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt. She discusses the cause of free men with Dr. John Schwarzwalder, General Manager of KTCA-TV. Here is Dr. Schwarzwalder. That Free Men May Live is the theme of this continuing series of programs, as, in a much larger sense, it is the theme of all the best efforts of mankind. And the struggle for freedom has, of course, many different aspects in many widely separated places. But surely our guest for today, Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt, is among those who have most effectively, through the years, served in this struggle for freedom. And Mrs. Roosevelt, if I may start our interview by asking you what, in your opinion, the balance should be in this whole matter of armament and disarmament. We're told, for example, that we must spend 70% of our budget, and then we're told that it's going to be cut a little bit, and then we're told Mr. Khrushchev is going to cut his budget a little bit, and then we're told of new scientific things and we must do more. Uh, do we have to have total disarmament? Is there a possibility of arriving at peace uh, through partial cuts in this? Where, where should we stand in this? It's a matter of great confusion to all of us, I know. Well, I should say that in the long run, we would all hope to have total disarmament. But uh, to reach that, you must do so many things that I think one should begin by attempting to control armaments. Perhaps, first of all, uh, the most dangerous armaments. And uh, that, of course, is what Mr. Khrushchev in his speech suggested. And that is the thing which I think uh, both our administration and the Russians are thinking about. They talk of total disarmament, and it sounds, or rather, I think Mr. Khrushchev made it sound as though it was possible within four years. That ignores the fact that actually you must replace it with rule by law. If you don't rule by force, you must rule by law. And you must put into some neutral body, in this case it would be the United Nations, some force to carry out the dis law decisions because we've never yet reached a point where human nature has become so perfect that there were no infringements of the law, whatever it might be. And therefore, I think we must look to that for some indefinite period. So I would say that to reach what we all ultimately hoped for, we had to have, first of all, the building up of a legal system and the establishment within the United Nations of a police force to carry out the decisions of the legal system. And then I think we have to realize that uh, we have to have universal membership in the United Nations because everybody must be under the same rule. You cannot leave one or two nations outside as outdoors uh, to prey upon the others, you have to include in the membership every nation. And that means actually the settlement of the political questions throughout the world. And this, I think, is going to take some time. And therefore, um, I'm not uh, at all convinced that we can have nothing happen. We must move, and I hope we will come to an agreement on stopping nuclear tests. I hope we will come to an agreement on slowly, um, through the establishment of an inspection system, which now seems possible, um, in a reduction of arms. You can't do it all at once. You do it gradually. And at the same time, 
you will build um, your legal system and begin to discuss and solve the political problems of the world. But this doesn't happen overnight, but it does have to happen simultaneously. I see, so that we can start with some of these we things. We can start, but we mustn't give people the, I think, false hope that they do not have to go on working for this for a long time. Uh, obviously, we must keep on working for this, and you mentioned, of course, that the, there must be a rule of law to replace the rule of force. Uh, even in the best regulated of communities and nations, there has to be some sort of police force to, in the final analysis, uh, enforce that law. In your opinion, and again, I, I'm sure we're talking about a long, long time away, but in your opinion, should this police force eventually be centered in the United Nations? Oh, yes, without any question, it must mm -hmm. be. Um, but I think there is a question that, of course, will come up as we discuss our um, situation in replacing force with law of what questions are submitted to this law. There will be a long period of discussion on how much sovereignty each nation is willing to give to this um, central body. And when you see how long it's taken in the United States um, and how bitter still are some of the struggles between states and federal jurisdiction and how long it's taking in Europe uh, to settle certain quite obviously necessary things like economic uh, unity on various sure. questions. I, I think we must not expect this to go through without much discussion and um, we must not frighten people by telling them that they will have to give up all their sovereignty. That, I think, is a thing that might delay us very much um, if we begin to talk about an overall world government, we will lose an enormous number of adherents. Whereas if we talk about building a law to replace force and gradually discussing what has to be submitted to that law, uh, I think we may work out a very workable and acceptable procedure. Uh, I do think from the earliest possible days, as soon as we have certain things that we agree to submit to international law, we should set up our enforcement police force within the United Nations. And confine it to these things yes. we are agreed oh, yes. upon. Uh, Mrs. Roosevelt, I recall that some 10 or 12 years ago, the idea of any inspection at all was anathema to certain nations, and then there was an acceptance in principle, but with such uh, reservations that it seemed impractical, and you have just said that at the moment it appears that there can be a sort of, of inspection. Well, there are new, there are new technical discoveries mm. which make it seem uh, the trouble has always been a lack of confidence. Mm. Now, it, it would make it seem that under n some new technical discoveries, we won't need confidence. They will do it for I us. I see. <laughs> that brings me really to the second major topic that I wanted to discuss with you, and that is the whole matter of science. And I, I take it that uh, the progress of science, the tremendous things that have been happening, are, of course, perhaps the most important reason we have right now for wanting uh, some sort of, of disarmament, and surely uh, one of the important reasons for world peace. Uh, may I ask you what the United Nations is doing in order that the whole world may mutually benefit from discoveries made in one nation or another, and what can yes, it do? I think the United Nations has to depend upon the member nations' initiative in this field. I think that um, it has already been proposed that um, outer space be put under the jurisdiction of the United Nations. It should not be in the hands of any one power. Of course, the ideal thing, which I look forward to, but I don't know that it will happen immediately, is that in the whole area of science, whether it's 
medical or agricultural or whether you're a physicist, no matter what you are or what you're trying to discover, it seems to me the ideal for the future is that this be done by the scientists of the world and frequently there be exchanges and consultations. I think we will move much faster. I think we will find it to the advantage of humanity if there is no restriction on intercourse in the field of science because there the men are willing mm -hmm. to share and to work together. They are interested in getting as far ahead as possible and they want the advantage of the rubbing together of minds. And I, I believe that that is an area where we can get cooperation to a very great extent from individuals and where we can make great uh, steps forward because of the cooperation. I, I certainly know that you are right on this matter, the individuals wanting this sort of thing, and yet we in this country, as well as other nations, I have put all oh, the most stringent sort of restrictions upon our scientists, and indeed we are we have such penalties that many of them, if they were to divulge information, uh, might serve terms yes, in it prison. It has to come mm. through agreement, and I think it has to come through the United Nations proposals. Um, they many scientists would be considered to have committed treason if they yes. were to suggest uh, giving certain information to, let us say, the Soviet scientists. But um, if it is an accepted thing in the United Nations and the pooling of knowledge is seen, as I think it should be seen, um, as a value to humanity as a whole. And when you come into this field, it is really the value that you bring to humanity that is important. Mrs. Roosevelt, obviously the United States, as a very great and a very rich country, has a responsibility to uh, give as much to humanity, as you just put it, in terms of sciences as any other nation. And many people are, are much disturbed these days that we aren't keeping ahead in terms of scientific uh, education, that we aren't doing as much as we perhaps should and could in this respect. What is your view on this matter? Well, I, of course, am not a scientist, and I could not tell you whether we are ahead. When you talk about being ahead, you mean, I suppose, ahead of the Soviet yes, Union. Yes, of course. And um, I think it's very unfortunate that we always compare the two countries in this way. A, um, I think what we ought to do is to make sure uh, that we are giving those of our young people who are interested in science the best pr preparation for their future work that we can possibly give. And we ought to be willing to study what the Soviets are doing and to allow them to study what we are doing in the field of education uh, so that we are sure that both of us are giving the maximum opportunity to our young people as far as we can get any benefit from consultation. Um, I do not know oh, just um, how much we can get from each other. I think we can probably learn certain disciplines from the Soviet Union which we have not always uh, considered important, but which might be helpful to our young people. Uh, we've always felt that the freedom to think, think freely, was the overriding important thing. And I still think it is. But I also think that there are certain disciplines. Now, the Soviets lay so much stress on discipline that I think it goes too far. But, um, in a, in a democracy, you have to have enough discipline, for instance, to acquire the kind of self-discipline that makes you a good citizen. Now, it may be that we need a little more self-discipline in our scientists, I don't know. But it might, there's an area that we might explore. And um, if so, we might learn how to enlighten our young people to the point 
of realizing the necessity of self-discipline because we cannot have the imposed discipline that the Soviet young people have. But I believe our young people, if they understood what, it, what depended on their self-discipline, both as citizens and as uh, top people in whatever field they want to go into, um, would be quite capable of learning what self-discipline means. But you do have to know that there is a challenge to you. Indeed. Uh, Mrs. Roosevelt, to go to another topic, we are often told by a uh, great number of people that uh, the hungry man is not very much interested in freedom or democracy or any other of these concepts, that he's primarily interested in uh, food for himself and his family. Would you care to comment on that? And if you, if you happen to agree with that statement, uh, would you, would you uh, indicate what you think we could do about this? I agree with it completely because anyone who was in the areas of this country during the depression which is about the only time when i think we could say that we actually had uh, areas where for some periods of time there were hungry families mm -hmm. um, i think anyone who's in any of those areas knows that a man would have sold his right to vote for a good meal for his family without the slightest hesitation mm -hmm. and I think we have to face this as a fact. Now, I think that uh, this brings us to one of the most important things in any uh, government's consideration of peace, and that is the whole question of food of the world. Now, perhaps you saw in the paper not long ago that there is always great concern about um, what they call the explosion of population yes. in different areas of the world. That's one question but there is also the question of using the capacity for production in of foodstuffs to the limit of your ability a uh, not of course destroying your land enriching your land but um, making it produce as much yes. as it possibly can and finding out how that can be distributed now, this is something we've been very negligent of. We have that knowledge, do we not? In our own country, well, I'm told if that... we would work with food and agriculture and find out about the needs of the world, and what, of course, we have done uh, is, is a question... It brings about a question which I find very hard to answer. Mm. We have paid to keep land out of production. Mm -hmm. We have looked upon our surpluses as a burden. As I go around the world and get asked the question, how can you pay to keep land out of production when two-thirds of the peoples of the world go to bed hungry every night? I find that a very difficult question to answer. Yes. Because it is laziness on our part, which has never really made any of us willing to get the best minds in the country. Uh, to consult with food and agriculture of the United Nations, to find out the needs. We have a great range of climates. We can cooperate with Canada, um, which also has the possibility of raising certain things, but not the same range of climate. Um, we have a literate population of farmers. Uh, we have great advances in producing quantities of food. We need not consider this a burden if we would set the best minds down to thinking in how do you distribute how can it be done and uh, pay uh, at present when we do um, we pay so much for storage and for keeping land out of production that we might be able to balance that against uh, bringing up the prices that perhaps are on the world market. I don't know how this could be done, you see. Yes. I do know that uh, it affects a great many industries. For instance, we use a great deal of a certain kind of steel that is manufactured for the bins which hold our surplus foods. Mm -hmm. So you see, it affects a good many industries. Now, it means the cooperation of industry. It means real thought and planning. And we just have been lazy. 
Along that same line, it's, it's said, and I'm, I'm sure uh, you would agree, that a, a man who is ill is uh, much more interested in regaining his health than he is in uh, democracy, freedom, that sort of thing. Uh, what can we do and what ought we to be doing through, for example, the World Health Organization to make sure that this sort of thing, this sort of information can be disseminated very wide, well, widely? Well, we ought to give the World Health Organization all the support we can. Now, there is a difficulty. We are the ones who always object to having the budget raised. Uh, the reason for this is that, of course, our share of any budget is much the biggest. Yes. We, we do not pay, as other nations pay, a percentage on our national income because our national income is so much bigger than that of anybody else in the world that they fear always that we, by giving so much more, would demand control, and that frightens the other nations. Uh, so they set a limit for us of 33 and a third percent. And um, uh, we object strenuously if anybody suggests raising any of these budgets. I think perhaps what we ought to do is to do the limit and never object to the raising of a budget through the UN that we can. And then always do whatever we do bilaterally in consultation with the UN organization that is in that field. I think in that way we would avoid the accusation of trying to control people through economic pressures. Mm. And of course, uh, making people well is an economic pressure because for the first time, if you free them of malaria, they're able to do a day's work. And so it has a, a bearing on the economic conditions of the country. Mrs. Roosevelt, I know that you know that in the last year we have had more American tourists going to Russia than in perhaps uh, the preceding 10 years. And of course we've had uh, Soviet athletes and ballet dancers and scientists and hog farmers and almost anything you can name in great quantity coming over to this country. Is this so-called uh, cultural exchange uh, something to be encouraged? Are there positive, definite benefits from it, or is it sort of the frosting on the cake? Oh, I think where people go really to study something. I'm not uh, convinced that the exchange of tourists in the Soviet Union, until many more tourists speak Russian, no. has such very great advantages because their only contacts are through the interpreters and they go, they choose a tour and they see, it's as good as most tourists, wow. you see, <clears throat> but at present, what we need is greater understanding between the Soviet people and ourselves, and a greater knowledge of what they are actually accomplishing. Because we, for a number of years, felt that they could never do anything good well, of course, in 41 or two years, um, they've accomplished a great deal. Now, they've done it under compulsion. Um, we cannot operate under compulsion. But nevertheless, we should know what they have done. And the people who go abroad as exchange students or professors to study definite things I went, for instance, in the hope of learning a great deal about their education, and I learned a great deal. Mm. And I came back with very distinct ideas as to what we could learn from them and what uh, would not be possible uh, for us, what uh, would be undesirable. But, um, and I don't believe that we can expect from the average tourist as yet very much benefit. I was, I was interested in your comment about the uh, tourists uh, would have to, a great many more, would have to speak Russian. Uh, just in the last oh, three or four years, there has been a great uh, increase in the number of Russian classes taught in colleges by television. You would, you would encourage this sort of thing. Oh, yes. Why, the, the um, uh, State Department, of course, has increased uh, its insistence that our foreign service officers uh, begin to learn some languages um, and now 
you know, New York Times made a survey not, not very long ago and discovered that any number of our Foreign Service people spoke no language except English. Yes. And now it's fallen to only 15% that don't speak any language but English. Now, even one language is a help, but I would have it many more. Mrs. Roosevelt, time and again in these questions, we've come back to the United Nations, and I gather, and I think very few people would uh, argue the point, the United Nations, in your opinion, has done a great deal for peace. What, in your opinion, is the most important thing that the United Nations has done in order that free men may live? I think the most important thing is that it has brought together more people from more areas of the world and increase their understanding of each other. And that it has done not only through the General Assembly, but it has done it by the teams that go out in all the different specialized agencies. This has increased the knowledge of people about each other, which is probably the most important thing that we can do to increase our, our efforts toward peace. And my final question, Mrs. Roosevelt, uh, what should we do in respect to the United Nations in order to make it more efficacious in its efforts to bring Never peace to the world? Never forget that it exists as far as our government is concerned. Because we are such a strong nation, every now and then we act without remembering that we have the United Nations and that we should act through the United Nations. Uh, that, I think, is one of the most important things for us to remember. The temptation as a strong nation uh, is to act uh, on your own and then remember the United Nations afterwards and come and say, I've just done this, uh, please agree with me. That's what leads, in part, to the Soviet accusation that we own the United Nations. Fortunately, so far, what we've done usually gets ratified. Yes. But it gives the Soviet the handle to say, oh, the United States owns the United Nations. Now, it's important that we consult first. And I think that's one of the most important things we can do. Thank you very much. That Free Men May Live has been greatly honored to present on this program Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt, who has given us of her wisdom in order that we may better understand how free men may live. That Free Men May Live, a series of television programs concerning you and your freedom. Special guest on this program has been Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt, who was interviewed by Dr. John Schwarzwalder, General Manager of KTCA-TV. That Free Men May Live is produced by KTCA-TV, Twin Cities Area Educational Television Corporation for the National Educational Television and Radio Center. This program was produced through the facilities of United Nations Television. Director was Ray Dahl. That Free Men May Live was produced by Joseph T. McDermott. This is National Educational Television.